Hey, you can go ahead, Drake. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Optimizing Biological Nutrient Removal in Tennessee Wastewater Treatment Plants webinar series. This is the fifth webinar of the series. My name is Drake Smarch. I will be hosting your event today. We have one more webinar left for this series. A few things first. Please notice that you have been muted upon entry. This is to help reduce any background noise, but you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Another way to ask a question is through the chat box. Point out, uh, please send questions to everyone or directly to the panelist, but not to the presenter alone, as you will not be able to see them well in the presentation mode. The panelists and I will be monitor monitoring the chat box and the Q&A section. We will read them to the presenter at natural stopping points. Also, if you will, take the time to check out the yes or no buttons. They will appear as green, check mark, or a red X. Once you have clicked on the answer, please note that you will have to uncheck that button, otherwise that button will stay selected. Our presenter wants everyone to know that he enjoys your engagement and prefers to be interrupted with questions. So please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question that needs to be answered immediately. We will have three polls for you to answer, and possibly a fourth if we have enough time. The second question in the middle of the webinar will allow you to take a quick break. We will we were able to get approved for 1.5 CEUs for each of these sections for your wastewater license in the state of Tennessee. For folks that are viewing this training as a group, we will need you to email the names and license numbers to Allie Crampton, who will put her email in the chat after this section, and she will include you on the course roster. Her email will be Allie, A-L-L-E, period, Crampton, C-R-A-M-P-T-O-N, at tn.gov. This section this session will be recorded, and we will make it available to our Tennessee Plant Optimization website. Also, if you have Microsoft Teams on your computer and you feel that your WebEx is running slowly, closing out of Microsoft Teams helps WebEx run more smoothly. Now let me welcome Mr. Grant Weaver for the fifth session of our WebEx series. Grant has been working with us since 2014 on optimizing wastewater plants across the state. He is a professional engineer and licensed operator. Today, Grant will be talking about case studies of actual plants. Hope you enjoy the presentation. Please ask questions and give comments. We all appreciate your engagement, and Grant loves the interaction. Thank you, Drake. That's a fact. Uh, the more questions, the better. Uh, in fact, uh, I did a webinar yesterday, and uh, for one of the comments on the webinar was they were having trouble um, getting uh, logged in to ensure that they get their credits. And, and, the, and the writer says, if I can't get my credits, I'm signing off. Well, that's our big fear, you know, when we're presenting is that we're speaking to an audience of zero. So. Uh, the more conversation, uh, the better. Uh, I love being interrupted. Wow, we've done a lot of them. So those of you who are still with me, still with us, thank you for being here. We've done five sessions. So five times an hour and a half, that's like seven and a half, maybe even eight hours of me yapping away. And here I go for one more today. Today we're going to do a fair amount of review. I like doing the review. I want to drive home the message. And what's the message? The message is most every treatment plant, and I mean by most every treatment plant, I mean the vast majority, especially of activated sludge treatment plants, most every treatment plant can be operated, designed for it or not, to measurably reduce total nitrogen and total phosphorus. So today I'm going to give you some examples of facilities 
that were not designed for total nitrogen and or total phosphorus and are milking uh, nutrient removal out of their facilities. I want to challenge you to look inward at your facility to look for opportunities. Now, we were going to do a brainstorming uh, next week, and we're putting that off for an extra week. There's a little scheduling conflict. So sorry about the last minute uh, change, but please note that uh, I guess in all uh, due respect to my uh, Irish uncle, that we're going to postpone it from St. Patrick's Day to the week of March 24th. So uh, next week's session will not occur next week. It's going to occur on March 24th, and I sure hope you'll tune in. That's usually the favorite session, which may not be saying much. I don't know. Um, let's begin with a little uh, uh, check on everybody's knowledge. So uh, back to you, Drake, if you want to you take this on. Okay, we're going to wrap up these answers here soon. Looks like we're still waiting on a couple more people. Okay. Grant, it looks like you're muted. Ah, I was muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, is it back to me? Doesn't look like it's been sent back to me. I'll okay, share screen. There we go. Now I am.
All right, hello everyone, I'm back. <laughs> okay, is there any questions or comments from the previous um, webinars? If they are, if there are, any time, uh, type them in. And um, Drake, Bree, Karina, Ali, someone in that uh, team there behind the curtain will uh, get any of your questions or comments today. And if they come in, anyone feels appropriate, please go ahead and interrupt me. What I want to do is a little review, and uh, I think it's going to be you know, a good 30, 40 minutes of review. Again, the whole idea here, what we're trying to excite operators about is going towards excellence, moving from permit compliance to excellence in operation, challenging yourself to get your facilities to remove nutrients. Nutrient limits are coming. Now is the time to do it before the permit limits are, are there uh, to uh, see what you can get out of your facility before you're under a tight timeline. It's all about creating the right habitat. Bacteria are stupid little critters. Um, they don't have brains. They, they don't have book clubs. Um, they just react to their environment. So if we give them the right environment for what we want, um, we will get the results we want. So the review here is to talk about those environments and those conditions so that we can be bacteria farmers and, and grow the bacteria. So for nitrogen removal, it's a two-step process, right? We've got a, an oxygen-rich environment where we're converting ammonia to nitrate, and then an oxygen-poor environment. Unfortunately, it has to happen in that order because in the oxygen-poor environment is where we need a lot of BOD. So engineers have come up with some clever ways of doing this. We talked a bit about that in previous sessions. Um, the science of this is a high, uh, highly aerobic environment. I like to use this ORP tool. I talk about it. But you can see to get ammonia removal of these uh, categories on this YSI table that I stole, um, ammonia removal is the is the process that needs, needs the most oxygen, the strongest uptake of oxygen. For ammonia removal to occur, here's some parameters. Um, textbooks over the years have talked about the difficulty and the fussiness of the bacteria that remove ammonia, uh, but most facilities that I've worked with, and I've worked with over 100 now, uh, most facilities find that once they dial in ammonia, unless something goes really wonky, um, ammonia is fairly constant. The, the, the wonky things would be a major storm or some kind of crazy uh, industrial toxic discharge or a major power outage would occur. But even uh, the ammonia-removing bacteria, my good Buddy, the microbiologist Michael Girardi tells me they will live up to 24 hours without oxygen. So the bacteria that remove ammonia, they can survive up to a day without oxygen. So that should help uh, comfort people as we go into the next step of once we create the nitrates as we remove ammonia and we need to have an oxygen poor zone give you some comfort that your bacteria should survive it. So ammonia is going to use up a lot of oxygen, and it's going to make the water more acidic. I talked about alkalinity being like ice cubes. It's a buffer. As the alkalinity diminishes, um, that's a precursor, an advance warning that your pH is about to change, much like the ice cubes on this glass that I have sitting right in front of me as they get smaller telling me that it's getting closer to that temperature change. The second step, once we've converted the ammonia to nitrate, is to get rid of that nitrate, nitrate from that previous 
uh, chemistry drawing there. We had NO3. There's a lot of oxygen. So we want to stress the bacteria so that they don't have free oxygen to breathe. They're going to want to stay alive. So they are going to look for some kind of other form of oxygen. And they'll breathe it off of the nitrate. A DO probe is of some value, but it gets a little minimally valuable here to you because we're going to look for a dissolved oxygen level awful close to zero. And ORP is a nice tool. I like to set a target of about minus 100 uh, for the ORP for, for nitrate removal. Now, any of these numbers that I put out here are rules of thumb. These are, do not take any of these uh, numbers as if they come down biblically to you. Uh, these are numbers that are just a good starting point. And then using your facility, going to dial in uh, the treatment. It's to reestablish your targets. So nitrates converted to nitrogen gas, and you get alkalinity back in, about half the alkalinity. That's not important for waters that are already well buffered uh, here in the northeast with our granite rocks and uh, high acidity. High acidity, it's very important to us. Um, what's important to pretty much everybody is all of that oxygen that was put into the treatment plant to remove the ammonia now gets used to look above that line. It gets, that oxygen gets used to remove BOD. So you've already paid for the oxygen, so if we can get BOD removal in an air off zone, and frankly, this is how I first met Brett Ward. Brett was a strong advocate for this nitrate removal as an energy savings, and correctly so. So we can look at this either way. Is it an energy savings or a way to reduce nitrogen? Both being good things. As we'll talk about in a minute, excuse me, uh, the bacteria that remove nitrate, they will eat many forms of BOD, and the preferred form of organics is the same form that the phosphorus removing bacteria. So they don't play well together, the nitrogen removing bacteria and the phosphorus removal removing bacteria. But remember, neither of them have brains, and as, um, as, uh, oh my gosh, who was it that said this? Um, from uh, the Athens treatment plant, uh, Russell. Uh, I'm struggling to remember Russell Coleman. Is that his last name? Russell said that if we have brains as operators and we can't outthink out the bacteria, then shame on us. So we want to create these referees, if you will, and manage the system so that the more prized food goes to the phosphorus removing bacteria. We talked about that. I'm going to get back into that again uh, here in the next few minutes. So here's some rules of thumb. Again, these are good places to start um, and in your targets and your process control. Uh, anything so far on nitrogen removal or anything else? Any questions comes in or any comments? Nothing so far. All right. Thank you. Phosphorus. What is it, about 65 or 70 people listening in, so thank you for that. Um, phosphorus removal. It's three steps for phosphorus removal. Uh, the first two steps uh, happen in one uh, type of environment and the third in a radically different environment. And we're going to do this kind of opposite from what we did for nitrogen removal. Nitrogen removal, we needed the air first, and then the no air or low air. Now we need no air. Uh, septic conditions. And septic conditions create the food source that the phosphorus removing bacteria uh, like to eat. And in fact, uh, pretty much the only thing they like to eat. If you don't create volatile fatty acids, we're not going to have much luck with biological phosphorus removal. Okay, and if this uh, chart's starting to make any sense to you, uh, we're way over here in the negative zone. Uh, if we're measuring ORP, we're way past what our dissolved oxygen meter will 
will measure. Uh, it'll peg out at zero, and we're now well below zero oxygen. There is no oxygen here, and the bacteria are hungry enough for oxygen to breathe and grow that um, they're going to be breathing the oxygen uh, um, off of some pretty strange compounds down here in the negative um, ORP territory. And as they do, in the septic conditions, we're going to break down um, organic compounds to volatile fatty acids. The breakdown, the whole process requires a lot of BOD. So um, this is uh, something that's a, a real concern to many Tennessee treatment plants. If you have a high amount of infiltration and inflow, your influent wastewater is going to may not have enough BOD to support both nitrogen and phosphorus removal. So case-by-case -case strategies for how to deal with that uh, need to be developed. Or you're either going to be permit non-compliant with the time cone or be buying some kind of chemicals to, physical, uh, to chemically treat the phosphorus or some kind of chemicals to supplement the BOD. And we want to try to avoid all of those things. So again, when do you want to learn the lessons of this? Now, before those permits come into place. Also in septic conditions, we need the bacteria that are going to eat the volatile fatty acids to chow down, all right? So they're going to consume the volatile fatty acids, the organic matter, something that's almost broken down to, to a gas, almost methane gas. Um, and as they do, they're going to become energized. They're not really going to grow. They're just going to get ready to grow. And the craziest thing is as they do this, they release phosphorus back into solution. So coming out of this zone, one of the process control tools is to measure not only the ORP inside, which is going to be very low, uh, same as that uh, BFA production, but we're going to be releasing phosphorus. And we're going to look for the soluble phosphorus. And in the, in the same way of saying soluble phosphorus is orthophosphate. So we're going to be looking for an orthophosphate coming out of this tank or zone that's pretty close to three times what it was coming in. And if there's a lot of nitrates in there, the nitrates are going to preferentially eat those volatile fatty acids, and there'll be fewer volatile fatty acids available for the phosphorus-removing bacteria. And it's going to recap some of the tricks for how to deal with that issue. Okay, we've got some energized bacteria uh, that are ready to remove phosphorus. Uh, unfortunately, in getting ready, they've actually uh, put more phosphorus in the solution. So now we need to give them plenty of air. So if we've got enough air to remove ammonia, we've got enough air to remove phosphorus, right? Look at those two. P uptake is right up there in the same territory, a little bit to the left actually of the nitrification. So there's enough oxygen to drive ammonia removal. There should be enough oxygen to drive phosphorus removal. And as the bacteria grow, as they multiply, then they're going to be sucking phosphorus out of solution. Critical is the pH. pH in the aeration tank needs to be at least 6.8. My experience is it gets down to 6.7 per day and they're on a hunger strike. We don't get biological phosphorus removal that day. If we keep it down there too long, we're going to kill off the phosphorus removing bacteria and they're going to have to repopulate. And that can take days or weeks for them to repopulate. So pH in the aeration tank is a critical parameter for biological phosphorus removal. So a review, we need an anaerobic zone um, and, an aer and an aerobic zone. And run through again some um, illustrations of mainstream and sidestream phosphorus removal.
Any questions or comments on that before I get into the technology side of things? There's nothing in chat so far. All right. Technology. What I like to do is I like for us as operators to quit being so passive with the engineering community. I like for us to understand the whys of their design, and if we understand the why they design it that way, kind of what's the thinking behind it, and seeing the more creative people, the more get things done with what we got kind of people that we are as operators, I want us to apply that knowledge of the science that I just reviewed along with the technology that I'm about to review and see what we can get out of our plant creatively. Well, there's two ways, two main ways to get the phosphorus out of the biologically. One is in the main tanks where every, all the flow is going, and another one is on one of the side streams, like a sludge side stream, uh, solid handling. So let's first look at the main stream. And there's lots of different buzzwords with uh, three or more syllables in them and, and uh, crazy names in them. But uh, let's skip all that and just look at what we're trying to get done in each tank so we can understand that. And then scratch our heads like uh, Joe's doing here. Joe Nowak in this picture. I guess he's not literally scratching his head, but he sure looks like he's in deep thought. And see what we can figure out for our facility. So a mainstream design would be something like this, all right? You may or may not have a primary clarifier, but you'd have two zones, the anaerobic tank zone. Let me get my little marker here. Doing this makes for strange little uh, grids on your screen, and I apologize for that. That's I suppose some smart person has told me how to deal with that, and I just it didn't comprehend it. But in this uh, in this schematic, so we have a, a zero oxygen zone, anaerobic tank, fermenter tank, and it's ahead of the aeration tank. This is for phosphorus removal. Because in this tank, we need to create volatile fatty acids. Right, needs to go septic. So we need no air and probably very little mixing. Maybe have no mixing except a few times a day to resuspend the junk that settles out. And because in a septic tank you're going to create volatile fatty acids. If you're receiving septic trucked in, every truckload bringing in a lot of volatile fatty acids. I'm going to close this out, and uh, so we'll create the volatile fatty acids in this tank. The volatile fatty acids are going to be eaten by two kinds of critters, the kind that are in the return sludge. Uh, uh, they're all in the return sludge. That's where they come from. So in the return sludge from the bottom of the clarifier, it's going to contain some bacteria that remove nitrates, right? If you're removing ammonia and creating nitrates, then there's going to develop a population of bacteria that want to eat those nitrates. And they will outcompete the phosphorus removing bacteria for the volatile fatty acids. Once, the, once they're supplied with the volatile fatty acids they want, then the population of phosphorus removing bacteria will grow and develop. They'll remove, they'll chow down on the volatile fatty acids. And if they do, they release, release Soluble phosphorus, phosphate, orthophosphate, which is the PO4 in the solution. This phosphorus then, along with the bacteria, move into the aeration tank. These energized bacteria grow, and as they grow, they suck all that phosphorus they release out and a whole lot more so that the soluble phosphorus concentration, if everything's dialed in, is crazy low. And pretty much all of the phosphorus that's going out in the final effluent 
is in and with the total suspended solid. That's the game plan, okay? That's the strategy. The weakness, as I just mentioned, is that competition for the nitrate. So uh, that can be reduced by creating a anoxic tank ahead of the anaerobic tank and let the bacteria in that tank feed on the influent BOD. So it's a tank that's maybe not as septic as the anaerobic tank. You let some of the BOD get consumed by the nitrate removing bacteria and so that in the anaerobic tank, the one that goes truly septic, you'll create the volatile fatty acids and they'll be available to the phosphorus removing bacteria. Now, sophisticated plants that are designed from scratch may have these two tanks switched around with internal recycle. They may have duplicates of the anoxic and the anaerobic tank uh, before and after the aeration tank. All kinds of configurations. But the concepts are what I'm talking about uh, right now. Creating those environments and getting the bacteria, getting the volatile fatty acids, um, to the phosphorus bacteria and doing that by providing the nitrate removing bacteria as an opportunity to, to consume other forms of BOD. Since the nitrogen removing bacteria prefer volatile fatty acids, they'll take them first. They're their steak. They'll eat that before the salad. So, but if they don't have any steak, they want to stay on by the salad and the chicken. All right. Any questions or comments on that? None. Right? Okay. So we got a couple of good old boys from Montana here. Uh, the, the guy in the white hat works for the state. You know, he's from the state. He's here to help you. They do have a program uh, where they provide technical assistance that Pete Bediture, and that's uh, Dave Harris of the Mile City, Montana treatment plant. That's an oxidation ditch plant, but I just like the picture of the two of them, so I put it in here. So how do you troubleshoot a plant that's designed to remove phosphorus but isn't getting you the numbers you want? Okay, an activated sludge treatment plant. So. Remember how I mentioned that there should be about three times as much soluble phosphorus leaving that anaerobic tank as what goes in there? Well, I did. <laughs> I heard myself say it. And uh, how does that happen? That happens because you're creating the volatile fatty acids, the food that the phosphorus removing bacteria like to eat, and as they eat it, through some crazy metabolic pathway described by the Krebs cycle, if you're into these things, um, they release phosphorus in the solution. So they're getting energized. They're not growing, they're just taking in the energy ready to grow and multiply. And when they do, they release phosphorus in the solution so that going out of that anaerobic tank, it's about three times what it was coming in. So if it's not three times, if it's less than three times going in, you're not getting one of two things. You're either not getting the volatile fatty acids produced, or they're not getting to the phosphorus from moving bacteria, and they're not consuming them. If you get more than three times, you've got an anaerobic tank that's gone so septic that it's actually turned into a digester and is breaking down bacteria and um, their cells are exploding and out comes the phosphorus. So you got you got a death scene if, if you're getting more than three. So if you're getting less than three, you're not prepping this plant for phosphorus removal. And the, by far the simplest way to deal with that problem is to make that tank more septic by allowing solids to settle on the bottom and as they do to create a septic blanket of sludge. 
Now, you can't leave that there forever because, as I said, um, it'll go into a digesting mode and the bacteria will just start busting apart and you'll be releasing more than three times as much. Plus, you'll be parking your mixed liquor into this tank, so you can't leave it there too long. So, turn on the mixer at least once a day uh, and thoroughly mix that tank and uh, or as often as uh, three or four times a day, uh, allowing it to settle, become septic, and then resuspend. Okay, if I didn't include the slides, and I apologize. So if you are, if coming out of this tank, maybe that's the next one. No, it's not. Um, so bear with me. I apologize. Um, Forget this uh, up at the top, the writing up the top, and let's say that coming out of that tank, it is almost spot on three times, but the effluent is still high in phosphorus. If that's the case, then that anaerobic zone is doing what you want, you have no issues there, you have one of two other problems. Okay, the most obvious problem is um, the aeration tank isn't doing its job. It's not, we're not getting the growth, the bacterial growth. If that's the case, my first suspect is going to be pH. Is the pH too low? If the pH is too low, then it isn't going to work unless you adjust the pH. I've worked with treatment plants in the Northeast where one year they'll adjust the pH, and the next year they'll use or they'll use chemicals to adjust the pH, and the next year the price of chemicals changes so that it's cheaper for them to buy chemicals to precipitate the phosphorus. Um, so that's a possibility. The pH in the aeration tank could be too low. That magic number is 6.8. I like a little elbow room, so I like to have a target of 7. Could be not enough dissolved oxygen, not enough DO, but if you're removing ammonia, you probably have enough dissolved oxygen. So that's a possibility, but it's not as likely. And then the third possibility that I've seen is, um, I know I just got a big note here. Somebody wants to join in and draw on this. So I'm going to let you do that. I'm not sure what that means. Um, yep, so Sean, you can start drawing if that's what you want to do. Um, oh, I wait for you to do that. I'll keep talking. So if the um, dissolved oxygen is good, if the pH is good, and what I've seen in summertime, particularly in Tennessee, is in the warmer waters and the, uh, the phosphorus removal declines. And um, I believe, and I'm kind of a one-man band on this, I believe that that could be because of just so much BOD destruction in the anaerobic zone that, um, that there's not even enough BOD to, to grow the new cells in the aeration tank. So those are my three priorities. When I'm looking for if the phosphorus is coming out, I'm getting a nice release. I have a nice um, anaerobic zone, but I'm not getting the uptake in the aeration tank. I look first at um, pH, the dissolved oxygen, and if it's summertime and I get better numbers in the winter, I'm going to start thinking, man, I need to schlep some extra BOD in there somehow to drive that. Now, it's possible that you get both, <laughs> that aeration tank's doing its job, yet the, air, yet the effluent still has a higher phosphorus than what you need it to be. And that can happen by getting a secondary release. So the phosphorus is removed. It goes in with the sludge, and then something happens. There's a channel leading, leading to the clarifier that's silting in, 
And if it does, the bacteria are dying and releasing phosphorus. Don't want any of that. You've got to keep no sedimentation now from the aeration tank all the way out to the outfall. The second possibility is, a more likely possibility is your, your sludge blankets are getting released in your, sec, in, your, in your waste sludge. So the fix on that is to increase your sludge wasting or sludge return rate and lower that sludge blanket. Okay, enough of that. Any questions or comments on that? Nothing so far. All right. I'll keep going. A side stream. So we did mainstream. Now let's do the side stream. This is exciting stuff, huh? <laughs> I hope folks are still with me. Hey, Grant. If they ever were. Yeah. Hey, Grant. There was a question in the chat box. Um, it says, uh, do our primary clarifiers remove the VFAs before it can reach our aeration basins. We receive a lot of septic sludge, but are we getting the benefit of septic sludge in pee removal? Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to address a plant that's actually managing the primary clarifiers to blow the solids uh, from the primary clarifiers into their aeration basins, in part because of that concern. But it's more than that. Um, volatile fatty acids um, are formed in the septic condition. They will go into the water, okay? So the, the short answer to the question is no, you're really not. Um, volatile fatty acids will be in the water column and will flow through in the water column, leaving the primary clarifier. And they'll be available to whatever bacteria wants to eat them whether they're denitrifying bacteria or phosphorus in the bacteria. However, to boost that, um, the primary clarifiers may prove to be your enemy by removing other forms of BOD in the, in the form of primary sludge. So it's a great question, and there's actually a lot to that. Um, when you do the math on how much DOD is necessary to drive the nitrogen and phosphorus removal, you're probably going to find that you need something like 200 milligrams per liter of BOD coming into the aeration tank, not coming in as a primary clarifier. So um, we can get total nitrogen and total phosphorus removal at lower BODs. It's just trickier. So the great question and uh, spot on. I like that. You, you, connecting the dots as to what, what I'm talking about. Is there anything else or follow-up to that? Uh, if not, I'll move on. If there is, I'd love to chat. Doesn't look like it. All right. All right. We're in Missoula, Montana here. This plant has um, a lot of tanks. Uh, but we're going to talk about side strain. Now, facilities that are designed for side stream, what they do is they create the volatile fatty acids actually using the primary sludge. They take the primary sludge and they put it in something that doesn't look much different than a gravity thickener, the big tank. They let that sludge digest enough to create volatile fatty acids, just like a septic tank does. And they typically purposefully take only the clear water from the top. The thinking being, and I think it's uh, not that important, but I guess if you're spending millions of dollars on a new facility, what the heck, why not do it this way? Um, but their thinking being, um, let's keep the sludge to a minimum so that we don't bring as many filaments into the treatment plant. Uh, again, I think that's an overrated concern. I've seen a number of facilities do just fine uh, cooking their solids and bringing the solids and the liquid. But the idea in the side stream is they'll create septic conditions. They'll pull the supernatant off. The supernatant is rich in volatile fatty acids. I think they're going to go up and around. There they go. So the volatile fatty acids are going into another septic tank, another anaerobic tank, 
And this tank is getting the return sludge, right, coming from the bottom of the clarifier. So in the return sludge is going to be the phosphorus-removing bacteria. They're going to consume the volatile fatty acid. You're going to get that phosphorus release, okay? If the aeration tank has the right condition, phosphorus will be taken in by bacteria. The bacteria will now have a higher concentration of phosphorus than they did before, and your effluent will have a far lower concentration. If I kind of beat the death here, the nitrate-removing bacteria will also consume the volatile fatty acids. So a tricky way to deal with this, and I think maybe this makes more sense than one of my earlier illustrations, in the fermentation tank will create the volatile fatty acids. They're going to bypass the first tank where all the return sludge goes with a low oxygen environment in that anoxic tank. The BOD coming out of the primary clarifier is their only source of BOD. They will use that. Um, and then there will be many lower nitrates going into the anoxic tank. You'll get more bang for the buck on the volatile fatty acids that you're producing and transporting into that anaerobic tank. They will, this will really boost phosphorus removal, a system like this. So those are some technologies, mainstream, side stream, how the engineers have designed facilities to remove phosphorus. So I'm thinking now is a good time for the second, um, uh, what do you call it, polling question. And uh, we're running a little ahead. Should we have the break now or should I uh, keep going and then have the break in a few minutes? Maybe we can do a yes, no on that. How about that? So yes, break now. Or no, wait uh, 10 minutes for a break. Yes is break now, and no is wait 10 minutes. And then uh, Drake will give us the response to that, and we'll act accordingly. We're going to have a five-minute break either now or in 10 minutes. What's what's the uh, audience uh, decision on that one, right, Drake? It looks like... getting evenly divided here. <laughs> if we're evenly divided, uh, I've got this thing to have at the break now, so uh, I guess I was going to opt for having the break. Okay, sounds good. Do you want me to do the poll first? Why don't you, um, what we're going to do is you set the poll up, and we'll give them five minutes to answer the poll. Okay. And uh, we'll get back together uh, according to my clock here. Uh, the East Coast, it's 11.49, so it's 10.49. So we'll round it up, and we'll get back at uh, five minutes of 11 um, Central or five minutes of 11 noon. And here's the poll, and uh, I'm going to put myself on mute and be back in uh, five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, there's the results. Wow, a lot of grade four operators. Okay, if you want to hand it back to me, I think we're about ready to uh, resume this here webinar. Brian, if I can interrupt for a minute. Sure. Um, as we're looking at the numbers on the grade operators, actually the wire in the Summit Training Center is looking for volunteers to help um, evaluate workloads and description of workloads for grade one operators or operators that operate grade one facilities. We're working on a state exam, and that's part of the state exam uh, test compilation. So if anybody wants to volunteer to be part of statewide st uh, exam for the operators, so you're not forced to do the ABC option. Patrick's working on that, and he needs folks that operate grade one facilities, even if you have license higher than grade one, and all the grade one licenses. If you would reach out to Patrick Dwyer that, that she would be interested in helping with this project, trying to get us a state exam for operators of these systems. I don't know if that made any sense, but if you hold grade one in license or if you operate grade one facility, please get a hold of Patrick Dwyer and let him know. There's very few of you guys, so we have very limited pool. So thank you. Thank you, Dwyer. Thank you, Grant, for the interruption there. Oh, thank you. Sounds like a nice effort. So what we're, what it sounds like, I understand, uh, TDEC is trying to come up with a better, more appropriate way of getting operators for class one facilities, making an exam that is more real world than what they're finding with the uh, ABC system. And, you know, any efforts to make our exams <laughs> sync up with what people really need to know to work at treatment plants is, is a good thing. It's a, it's a struggle to do that, and uh, it's a struggle work, worth making. All right, at the beginning here, I mentioned that next week's webinar will not be next week. It's going to be the week after. We had to make a scheduling change. And I, anybody who missed that at the onset, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So if you're planning on tuning in to our webinar where we're going to talk about a very specific, get some plants that we'll be visiting in just a few weeks' time, get them to talk about their facilities and as a group, see what opportunities we might think that they have for improving nitrogen and phosphorus. should be a good session. It won't be next week. It'll be the week after, the 24th. Uh, any other questions or comments come in uh, during, uh, during the break? If not, I'm going to get myself moving forward um, and continue this here webinar. Anything come in? No. All right. So let's get creative now. Now the fun part. So your plant is not designed for phosphorus removal. How do you get that facility to remove phosphorus? Well, first I want to disassemble the uh, the design plant and make it look more like the activated sludge plant that, that we're here to talk about today. So there may be a primary clarifier, there may not be a primary clarifier. How do you get that kind of a facility to remove phosphorus? Is it a lost cause? I say no, it's not a lost cause because I'm going to look down to the far right bottom that sludge storage tank. Probably now aerated, it might be a digester, it might just be a holding tank. Um, maybe it, it, it's an empty tank that I'm not even using right now, but there's a vessel somewhere that I can take and I can make that septic. If it's an aerated sludge digester and I can still meet all my sludge rules without aerating it all the time, 
and I'm going to cycle the air so that it's off most all the time, maybe just turn it on while I'm dewatering or, or supernating the, the content. If I do that, or if I uh, have another vessel that I can use, maybe I'll put some sludge in there and let it sit long enough to go to septic. Of course, if it does, it's going to create volatile fatty acids, right? Because it's a septic tank, it's going to degrade and create that food source, just like a residential septic tank does. And as it does, since we now have a mixed liquor that's going in there as waste, there's bacteria that are coming from our aeration tank going in there. We're going to start returning some of those bacteria back into the aeration tank. With time, we're training our bacteria to prefer to grow some of these phosphorus removing bacteria. And that population will increase. And as it does, the, the the phosphorus removing bacteria that got energized by their stay in that fermenter, when they're in the aeration tank, they will suck phosphorus out of solution. Rule of thumb I like to use is you waste about 10% or you return about 10% of what you were wasting. So if you're wasting um, 100 pounds a day of, uh, of solids, then you want to send about 10 pounds a day back into the aeration tank. So you have to adjust your wasting a little bit because now you're bringing the solids back, so maybe now you've got to waste 110 pounds a day. And, and the 10% is a close enough rule of thumb. You can do it by gallons or pounds. I'll be giving you some examples of facilities that are doing that. Uh, that's the whole point of today is to do some case studies. So. If there's no questions about any of that, finally, you know, after uh, an hour in, um, we're ready to do some case studies. Hey, Grant, this is yeah. free. Um, I just now got back a little bit late, so I'm not sure if this question was relayed to you, but we had a question in the Q&A that said, could you provide some examples of how operators can collaborate more with engineers, and how have some utilities been successful in improving that relationship? Oh, man. I'm, I'll answer that when I'm all done, but don't do it before. When I'm all done, can you let me know if that was an operator or an engineer that answered that asked that question? But let's not let's not spoil it by uh, by uh, getting that information first. What it takes is a whole, in my opinion, it takes an empowered operator role, right? We is, I'm both. I'm an engineer and an operator, and I've got more college education than, than I deserve or uh, that did me any good. So uh, I can look at it from any angle, but I like to look at myself as an operator first. And operators are reluctant, in my opinion, to, um, to interact with engineers in any way other than a submissive role. Engineers, uh, like uh, overpowering spouses, are used to the other spouse dealing with them in a subordinate role and are comfortable with that, right? So it takes an engineer that is receptive and respectful of the operations perspective, and it takes an operations person that's bold and brazen enough to express their views and feelings. And um, it's me. I've been uh, in operations for many, many years. I've also been a consultant. But my view is if you're running the plant, uh, I'm going to kick down the doors and be the boss. Now, unfortunately, often downtown won't support me in that effort. And if uh, downtown won't support you because downtown hires an engineer independent of you or uh, makes the design independent of you, you really have no opportunity. Great question. It's a monumental shift that our industry years ago should have made, um, 
I'm curious, who asked that question, engineer or an operator? I don't know what to get an answer there. <laughs> you can't tell? Oh, it's an engineer. Yeah. All right. So that's the engineer I want to hire that would ask that question. I also okay. want to say, uh, if I can interrupt here for a bit yeah. on the topic, we have the Tennessee Optimization Plan uh, pro Program, Tennessee Nutrient and Energy Plan Optimization Program. And we look for experts, and a lot of the optimization studies or attempts result with recommendations that require an engineering solution, but not necessarily more concrete and more tech. And if we can get an interest in how can we sustain optimized operations through diagnostics, controls, uh, automation, all of those things are very important uh, to sustaining the optimized mode. But it takes huge collaboration with the operator because the operator knows what settings are needed, what controls are needed, and how they're able to operate the plant. So there is uncharted territory full of good work that can happen. So we are very much interested in working with the consultants. And if anybody in the audience actually is from the consulting company, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, Karina Bynum at pn.gov. I will talk to you any day, any time on this topic. So thank you. And if you can't find Karina, you're going to see my email address two or three times more before this presentation. Just email me and I'll connect you up. Uh, we are looking for that engineering perspective. I'm going to give you an example here in a minute, and it will really drive home, I think, the, the, the fundamental problem. It's not my first case study, but it's, it's one in the dollars speak loudly in this issue. Any other uh, comments or questions, that was fabulous. I mean, we could, I think Karina and I would like to have a webinar session on probably that very question um, and engage the engineering and the operations and municipal administration uh, communities in that discussion. All right, hearing no more, um, let me give you a couple of Tennessee examples, and then we'll go nationwide into a couple others. Love this story. Norris, Tennessee. Norris, um, East Tennessee, it's actually the same community where the Appalachian Museum is, the Smithsonian Branch uh, Museum, great place. Has this old, 1970s vintage treatment plant. I'll talk about it in a moment. The key, the difference, what I'm promoting here, uh, what we're promoting in this uh, in this webinar series, is the difference that operators can make. There's above average operators, and there's average operators, and unfortunately, there are below average operators. So we want to motivate the above average operators. Oh, and here's two of them right here, Tony Wilkerson and, and Doug Snelson of North. And the work they've done, they've done, has been recognized uh, by TDEC, we recommended them to the Governor's Council, and they received the Statewide Environmental Stewardship Award. What are they doing in North to deserve recognition? Well, they smile a lot, but more than that, They've taken this 1970s vintage treatment plant, which was designed for neither neither total nitrogen nor total phosphorus removal, a facility that they easily could wring their hands and say, the dang thing isn't designed for nitrogen or phosphorus removal. What do you expect from us? But no. The facility is designed to operate like this. The wastewater comes in and goes around in a ring, around the perimeter like a donut, 
Uh, it's all aeration basin, so it's a big plug flow. It's got some dividing walls along the way. Then it goes into a clarifier, which is built in the middle. This is plate steel. Uh, it's a Smith & Loveless product. And then from the clarifier, it's disinfected and goes to the receiving line. So for nitrogen removal, Tony and Doug, and uh, with help from TDEC and, uh, I don't know, uh, Brett Ward, and I may have had something to do with it too along the way, they've changed their operations. First, they raised the mixed liquor. This is a real common thing that we're doing. Um, I like to see a mixed liquor concentration that will be as high as you can get comfortably without having a washout in the clarifiers. I've heard people with different perspectives, and that's fine. That's my perspective. For nitrogen removal, this plant was always doing a bang-up job of ammonia removal with all that aeration. It has a hydraulic retention time. I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are, but these facilities are typically designed for a full day's hydraulic retention time, 24 hours. So if it's running less than capacity, it usually has more than that. A lot of retention time. So they're cycling now the air so that their blower's on a timer and it's aerating the tank for a period of a few hours and then it's off. And I didn't check to get the latest numbers, so Tony or Doug, if you, one of you are listening in and you, and you care to, you can tell us what your air on and air off cycles are and we can share that with everybody. But they run the air on and they run the air off to go from oxygen rich for ammonia conversion to nitrate, oxygen poor for nitrate conversion to nitrogen gas. And remember, the ultimate product of nitrogen removal is the nitrogen actually, instead of migrating out as part of the TSN, it actually goes into the atmosphere, the atmosphere which is three quarters nitrogen gas to begin with. So I like to say it goes home to mama. Now, the only unfortunate thing about data in North was these guys got so far ahead of the curve that they improved their nitrogen removal before they had years worth of nitrogen data showing how lousy things were going. So their nitrogen is now, and as far as the data set goes, it's pretty much always been below 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, their rolling 12 month average is typically five, six, seven milligrams per liter. Very respectable total nitrogen removal numbers from the store. Uh, plants designed to meet what's typically the first stage of uh, nitrogen limits is, as a regulatory agency starts to cramp down on it, tends typically the number. So Norris is comfortably below 10. Phosphorus removal, pretty interesting, okay? We've got three different stories to tell you on phosphorus removal. The third story is a combination of the first two. So the first story was, let's create a side stream fermenter. Now, Norris is slow. It's a, what, half MTD treatment plant. So 10% of the amount of waste sludge is not a lot of sludge. So Norris created side stream fermenters. And to do that, they went and purchased two of these IBC totes each about 300 gallons, 250, 300 gallons. They, and they put two of those um, on the bank there beside their, their uh, aeration basin. And they pumped mixed liquor into that and, and let it sit for two or three days and then we're draining it back. They got some results, not real consistent, not real great, but they were seeing an improvement in the phosphorus. Brett Ward made a visit, and they put their heads together, and they said, let's try um, creating a fermentation zone. Let's divert um, our influent around the zone. Let's turn the air off on the zone. No, let's divert our uh, return sludge around the zone. I'm sorry. Divert the return sludge away from coming in where the influent does. Move it 
a few feet further into the tank, there's a, there was a dividing wall already built in. Of course, the wall had some holes in it, uh, not because of age, because of design, so the flow could go into that area and then migrate through it into the subsequent area. So they created um, a, a zone right at the beginning where the influent comes in, it's influent only, and no air. Some of the mixed liquors migrating back into that through some of the holes in the wall because on the far side of it, it gets aerated on and off, and so the desert pushes some of the mixed liquor in, and that seems to be enough that the, it really helps them with phosphorus removal. But they're still not down to the one where we'd really like to see it. So uh, recently, we've been talking, and I think they're going to try, and I'll be curious to see uh, if they do and how it works, Try a combination. Create the, the, the VFAs using those uh, those uh, totes, and then use their fermentation zones and manage a little bit of how much they make sure they get enough mixed liquor going back in there to uh, to reseed that uh, zone and uh, see if they can bring that total phosphorus down below one. So a combination of the two. Now you can see looking at this that there's been a nice downward trend in the last few years as the good folks in Norse have started out right around four, which is a fairly high effluent phosphorus, uh, and bouncing now around two, so they've cut it in half. Okay. So what they did with the knife, well, you didn't see what the nitrogen started at, but I'm sure it was 20 or higher. So they cut the nitrogen from 20 ish down to five to 10 cut that in half or better, and cut the phosphorus in half or better, and we see a number of, of these bars that are below the one, so they're going to, with time, which is again an advantage, you're going to learn hands-on what is it that makes for those good numbers, and let's make more of those and less of the spikes so with experience. So there's the North story. I don't know if there's any questions or comments. I don't know if uh, Tony or Doug weighed in on their air on air off cycle. Uh, if so, I'll pause and yeah, address any of that. If not, we'll move on to another example. I'm not saying any. Okay. Hey, let's do another Tennessee. Now we'll go to the other end of the... the hey, guys. I have yeah. one. Sorry, I'm okay. trying to unmute. And I like, you know, multitask. It's really difficult. <laughs> Some of you can talk at the same time. I have something in the chat that is about does the zone have to have a wall? Uh, it does not have to have a wall, but without a wall, there's going to be a lot of migration of high dissolved oxygen. Um, there's a facility in Massachusetts that I've worked with for a number of years, does not have a wall, um, but the, they're getting uh, okay, but it would be a lot better if there was some kind of a wall. And I'll tell you, I've seen some pretty innovative walls. I've seen walls made out of um, fabric. I wouldn't really recommend that. Uh, at the shows, I've seen some, like, picket fence. Um, like fiberglass kind. So that I think would be very effective. Uh, something that's very porous, but more of a picket fence or, uh, or a, a weave, a woven thing with a lot of, uh, a lot of holes in it. So you're going to get better with a, with a wall, but not absolutely required. Uh, I've often laughed anybody that's traveled around with me. I've talked about throwing an old car into a tank and letting that car become your, your dead zone for anaerobic. So you just need a dead spot. Good question. Anything else? All right, let's go to one of the big guns here, the Nashville's Dry Creek Treatment Plant. Had the pleasure there of working with uh, Johnny McDonald, um, Jordan Fay of TDEC, uh, fantastic work in there, and then Dave Tucker and a whole bunch of people from downtown that really supported it, including uh, their consulting engineer, 
um, what's his name? Um, God. Um, yeah, it was Kenneth Schnars. Kenneth Brown and Caldwell. Very good. Thank you. Very supportive. So, Nashville. Let's take that bar out of there and talk about it. What 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 went on there? This facility is designed uh, with a, a dead zone in the aeration tank already for uh, as a selector. So let me get my little uh, red ovals here first. So those are the primary clarifiers, and those are the secondary clarifiers. Okay, primary clarifiers, secondary clarifiers. There's six trains in the secondary clarifiers. And um, if I can, I'm going to go up here and grab my little marking tool. There we are. So this is a train. So the flow comes through the primary, goes up, around, and back. That's one train. And and that's one sixth of the flow if all six of them are in use. And another sixth of the flow is the same thing on this train. And guess what? This train, same thing. And here's a surprise, this train, the same thing. And one more. So five of the six are in use. This one's empty in the, when this picture was taken. Now, in all five of them that are in use, you can see this first almost half of the before it makes the turn, it's a different color. That's because there's no aeration in there. And there is a wall right here. Right there, right there, right there, and right there. And these little spots you see are mixers, floating mixers. This was designed with the idea, and this is pretty interesting to me anyway, not really thinking about phosphorus removal, so I understand. Not really thinking about total nitrogen removal, but the design concept when those basins were built was if we create a low oxygen zone, we're going to call that a selector. And the selector is going to select against any filament that thrive in a high oxygen environment. Now what I've seen, and there's always exceptions, <laughs> and if there's even exceptions, so there's always exceptions. But what I've seen is the vast majority of facilities that go from a, that create a low oxygen environment as well as a high oxygen environment they typically have fewer filaments because as designed as a dry creek plant, it selects against the high dissolved oxygen filament by having that selector zone with no air. And then any low oxygen filaments are selected against because the rest of the tank has a lot of air. Okay. So, this facility was designed with a selector. The selector happens to create the perfect environment for an in-stream anaerobic zone for VFA production and um, uh, phosphorus release. And their ethanol phosphorus is typically well below one milligram per liter. So our uh, effort here was uh, let's look at the uh, nitrogen because their nitrogen uh, level was pretty high. And they experimented with one zone. So to help drive the nitrogen removal, there was a desire to increase the organic loading. To do that, they took one of the primary clarifiers offline, and we just looked at this one zone, the first zone, the top zone in the aeration basin. And let me walk you through um, the step feed and cycle aeration comments. So you're going to see these circles uh, appear and, and disappear. So the air in that, that flash zone there, let me back that up and do that again. That was so much fun, wasn't it? 
So that flash is the air cycling on and off in that zone. Now Metro is staffed, this plant staffed around the clock, and the four schmoes that are the operator there were required by the evil staff to come out and open and close aeration drops a couple times every cycle around the clock in all weather uh, during this pilot study because they didn't have any automatic controls that could change the aeration in that second zone. Well, frankly, it didn't do a heck of a lot of good for nitrogen removal. And that's when we started looking, or they started looking at the BOD loading. And you got to excuse me, I, I do this I and we when it should always be the be them, but uh, I don't know, it's egocentric personality I have. So the, the primary effluent historically goes to the front end of the aeration tank and then travels around uh, the tank. There is, in this design, in this plant, there's a step feed gate that would allow a portion of the primary effluent to be fed, bypassing that entire first half of the tank going into the second half. They had to do some finagling to get the darn thing to work. It hadn't really been used in a long time, but they did. They made the effort to do that and started bypassing a portion of the flow around to increase the BOD loading in that zone that the air is going on and off. Okay, why did they have to do that? Because they were already getting the ammonia removal, and to get the ammonia removal, most of the BOD, by definition, has to be gone, has to be gone, has already been consumed. So they supplemented that. That really helped. So those two actions dropped the total nitrogen considerably. It was pretty labor-intensive effort on um, Metro's part. There was no nitrogen limit, so they continued it long enough to demonstrate that it would work. As far as great data, uh, the data is only one-sixth of the plant was operated this way, so I don't have any great data display to show that. Um, that's the story. Uh, the story worked out, and my understanding is uh, they liked that, liked what they saw enough that the engineers in, in their planning for both what is it, White's Creek as well as Dry Creek, something that they're going to be mindful of in the future will probably influence their design at considerable cost savings. So for phosphorus removal, the idea was to maintain the selector. I will tell you this, that while uh, that BOD was being bypassed around through the step fees, there was a noticeable decline, not dramatic, but noticeable decline in phosphorus removal. So once again, we're, we've got the competition going on, competition for the BOD, the competition for the VFA, and as the denitrous players were developing uh, in the population, in the mixed liquor, I think that that was having an impact on the effectiveness of that first zone. Really exciting, one of the bigger plants uh, that we work with, typically harder to get the bigger facilities to take the kind of risk uh, to experiment like this. Any questions or comments on that? I think the next example is I'm moving out of, no, I've got one more in Tennessee before I move out of state. Okay, let me do a Harriman. Harriman is an oxidation ditch. Hey, Grant, there was a couple questions oh, good. in the chat box. Um, yeah. Did we, uh, so one said we had uh, savings of 300 to 500 per month, and the results have been great with PPTN, but not to say that we had upsets, but Doug, board behind us and we discuss and work through our upsets. Okay. So I, I thought that was a question. What behind us? What was that? Um, with Doug and I guess and the board behind us, we discuss and work through our upsets. So I thought that was a question. That was just a comment. That's tremendous. Okay. 
And that was our sermon. Okay, was that Tony then that was saying that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Tony was telling, telling us that in North, they did have problems, but they had a dedicated operator who was Judge Nelson, um, and instead of saying, oh, i got a problem, let's take it back the way it used to be, to push through it. Um, um, which that is a problem. Uh, if, if you don't understand why your plant's performing, what's making it perform the way it is now, then it's kind of scary, isn't it, to change its operation because since you don't really know why it's performing like it is now, you don't have the confidence you can bring it back to that. So a little support uh, goes a long way to provide the confidence that you can bring it back, uh, you can you can push through these problems. And in pushing through that problem, some of it's counterintuitive, and, you know, it would be like if you're driving a car and you start to swerve off the road, you'd want to swerve further when, when you really ought to go the other way. It's kind of like learning to drive on ice. Um, you really turn the car the wrong way sometimes to overcorrect. Right. There was another um, question. Have you ever worked on optimizing a uh, regard treatment plant that was using pure oxygen? If yes, can you share that experience? <laughs> Uh, there's a very big pure oxygen plant in the south, uh, southern part of Middle Tennessee, in Chattanooga, the biggest plant, one of the biggest plants in the state. So I had the uh, opportunity to visit there and to discuss, um, discuss options, but we really didn't have any uh, success implementing anything. So uh, I've had very limited experience. Uh, Chattanooga plant. I think there are opportunities there. Um, um, it's 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 a different world uh, in the pure oxygen. Much shorter retention times and kind of different environment. But uh, very limited experience. And uh, but I don't see any reason that uh, there shouldn't be opportunities. Anything else? That was it. Okay. Harriman's really not an activated sludge. We did oxidation ditch last week. Uh, but I just wanted to mention um, Harriman, and uh, this is Ray uh, Freeman on the right, uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with a great guy. Uh, Donnie uh, didn't really work with him that closely, but uh, the two of them uh, much deserve credit um, on an EPA website. Uh, TDEC has its TPOP website, right, for, uh, for nitrogen removal, uh, nutrient removal, I mean, uh, efforts in Tennessee. EPA is uh, actually following <laughs> Tennessee's uh, lead on this and uh, did a real nice write-up about four different treatment plants across the country, uh, one in Kansas, one in um, Kentucky, and a more general discussion of the work that's going on in the state of Montana. But the most recent addition was the Harriman treatment plant. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, that's kind of a big mouthful of a website there, but I think if you just look for EPA uh, National Nutrient Study, if you Google that, you're going to find your way to it. Um, or maybe we can uh, follow up and put this in an email to everyone. So really ought to see what's going on in some of the Tennessee plants um, that, are, that are doing great work. And we ought to celebrate a kind of improvement here. So you can look at that table, just a small part of all the nonsense that's up here. Um, this actually was initiated by TDEX, uh, John West, making a visit years ago. Uh, with the prior operating staff and saying, well, let's, we thought about turning some of your aeration down. So they're using about 25% as much electricity to, uh, for aeration, and the nitrogen's dropped from 10 to 2, and the phosphorus is dropped uh, by 25%. Yeah. I think it's continuing to drop even more. 
there's some numbers I had uh, for the facility. And of course, like any anybody, if there's a rock star, I want my picture next to him. So even though I look pretty horrible, that's me in the in the hat there. All right, I want to tell you a story about Kansas, and then maybe we'll wrap it up there. I'm a native Kansan. I grew up in Wichita. Um, uh, we had a cabin on a lake at Council Grove. Uh, I went to undergraduate school at Kansas State. Um, my family was from the Pacific Northwest, so our roots in Kansas are pretty shallow, and as our folks passed away, uh, me and my three brothers, or my three brothers and I, uh, we all blew out of town, but uh, that's that's where I grew up, and I grew up in this here town of Wichita. Now, Wichita is a pretty good-sized community, and this treatment plant, um, to get a perspective of the scale of it, um, kind of in the, in the top right, right where it says sideways, City of Wichita Sewage Treatment Plant Number 2, and then there's a little crazy little icon. Those things right below the, below the icon are trucks. And on the other side of that building are more vehicles. So you can get a scale perspective of the size of this treatment plant. Okay. I am so pleased to discuss this pilot study that the city is taking on. And it really goes to the heart of the question that I was so excited to get from the engineer. How do you collaborate between the engineer and the operation? And here I want to, in telling this story about this pilot study that's just beginning in Wichita, put it in perspective. For years the city has been looking at what are they going to do for nitrogen and phosphorus. Kansas has a target and I'm doing some work for the state of Kansas like I'm doing in Tennessee. Um, their target is 10 milligrams per liter of nitrogen, total nitrogen, and one milligram per liter of phosphorus. They want every mechanical plant to meet those numbers. Um, and then that's their short term 10, 15 year horizon. And then they'll come after them on a case by case with more restrictive numbers. But they're looking for everybody to go from 10 to 1. So Wichita did an analysis and they came up with 380, 380 million dollars to bring the city's treatment facility into this 10 and 1. And this is by far the biggest treatment plant in the, in the city. Their operations team is trying to pickpocket <laughs> the design engineer who typically gets about 20%, so that's 70 plus million dollars, trying to reduce the scope of the work. So obviously that takes an engineer who's willing to, um, to walk away with from some design firms, which frankly, if I had won this job and sent somebody there, and, and they came back to me and said, you know, I took that $70 million fees that we were going to get and reduced it to some fraction of that, I wouldn't be very happy about it. So that's a fundamental problem. So we need an engineer who's looking at it differently, looking at the long game. All right, enough on the dollars. Nitrogen removal, what are they doing? Much like the Dry Creek, just so happens, Wichita treatment plant has six trains. They look a lot different, don't they? There's the aeration basin, one-sixth of the aeration basin, and right next to it is its secondary clarifier. Kind of nice. They got them married. Aeration tank married to a secondary clarifier. All of those round things to the right, the ones with the X's in them are trickling filters. The ones without the X's, the three, uh, dark ones are primary and intermediate clarifiers. The gray circles are trickling filters that are out of service, no longer in use. So the history is Wichita's plant number two was trickling filters. Trickling filters remain partially in use as roughing filters. 
and that secondary activated sludge was added following the trickling process. So for total nitrogen, the concept right now is the, this facility removes ammonia, gangbusters, but does not remove total nitrogen. So the idea is to cycle the air on and off in this basin. There's two problems uh, with the which does facing in doing that pilot effort. One is the BOD coming into those basins is often in the less than 50 milligrams per liter. So the, the pilot's going to suffer from a lack of BOD. And amazingly to me, because I grew up out there and I know how hard the water is, the pH is fairly low. And I think that must be because there's a lot of industry which does big aircraft community. So I think a lot of the metalworking industry must have an acid waste in it. So the BOD is low and the pH is low. So those are both are going to have to be addressed during the pilot and then long term, uh, long term, obviously, by taking trickling filters out of service. Phosphorus removal. So a phosphorus removal pilot, they just happen to have two, they call them centrate tanks, were built, haven't been used for at least 10 years, almost perfect size to serve as fermenters to take 10% of the waste sludge, side stream ferment it, and then return it back into the mainstream. So which does going to try that? They're going to take those fermenters or those centrate tanks, convert them into fermenters, and again, we're going to have a PA, we're going to have a BOD issue, but to feed them, they're going to use primary and secondary sludge. The secondary sludge, of course, will have the phosphorus removing bacteria in it. Um, and if pH was a problem for ammonia removal, then it's even worse of a problem for phosphorus removal, right? For ammonia removal, I like to see a pH in that aeration tank down in the bottom left of 6.5 or higher. For phosphorus, I like to see it at 7. So we're going to have to add chemicals definitely for pH in the Wichita to do both, to do either, let alone both, nitrogen and phosphorus. And to drive all of this, they've got a lot of trickling filters that they're going to want to take offline. So I'm lo really looking forward to the results of that uh, pilot test. I have not checked in in the last maybe even month to see if it started. It was supposed to start pretty much around this time of year. Um, But there is an example of an engineering operation collaboration that's going to take some very big picture engineering thinking to take this project, which I'm confident <laughs> can be made successful, if it's made successful, or reduce the scope of Wichita's uh, nutrient removal strategy by crazy serious numbers. I'm thinking a hundred million dollars or more. Any questions or comments on that? Um, if not, I think I'll draw this thing to a close. I'll just skip ahead. Um, unless uh, you want me to run through this Conrad one real quick. Anybody want to give me guidance on that? Questions, comments? Should I in a minute or two on Conrad, or should I wrap it up? Go for it. I think Go you for it. Talk okay. about Conrad. All right, Conrad's another very small facility. Instead of uh, having an around-the-clock uh, staffing like we talked about in uh, Dry Creek, uh, there's one guy that uh, put his foot down and said, well, at least let me spend at least an hour a day uh, at the treatment plant collecting my uh, samples and process control before you send me out on the streets to do other work. This is a facility that was uh, earthen-based, uh, no concrete uh, tanks, they're lined, uh, they're covered because it gets very cold there. Uh, the clarifiers froze the first winter, so they put a floating cover on that aeration basin. 
uh, wastewater goes in and through the aeration basin, then into the clarifiers, goes back into that building, uh, metal building at the bottom, there's UV, and then into the stream. So for nitrogen removal, the air in the aeration basin is simply cycled on and off. He raised the mix liquor, he did raise the mix liquor, and he cycles the air on it for two to three hours off for one and a half hours. His nitrogen dropped from 30 to whatever that number is, somewhere between 5 and 10. Uh, Conrad only does quarterly nitrogen tests. Dramatic, respectable drop using less electricity. Simply putting timers on the blowers. I think they already had it built into the data. Phosphorus removal. This is my phosphorus removing poster child. This digester was converted to a fermenter. As the air in the aeration basin cycled on and off, the air in the digester is cycled on and off. It's a big digester. You can see that. It's earthen filled. In fact, uh, to the left, those are sludge drying beds. Probably don't have too many sludge drying beds in Tennessee. There's too much rain. But out in the arid west, sludge drying beds are pretty darn effective. In particular, this is remote from town. It's at least a mile away from, from town. So the digester, air is cycled on and off, the same as the aeration basin, which was like, what, every couple hours? So it goes septic enough that you create the volatile fatty acids in there. And then some of that sludge, for about a year or so, maybe two years, Sludge was being returned back into the aeration basin, right? That was a manual effort, kind of pain in the patoot. So um, Keith Thought, Keith, T-H-A-U-T, uh, crazy redhead, um, Keith decided, hey, you know, I'm getting great phosphorus removal. Maybe I'll quit doing that and see what happens. So phase two once this treatment plant got populated with the phosphorus removing bacteria, I believe because of the configuration of those aeration basins, which is there's a lot of dead zones, um, it just kept, he built the population up by a year or two of sending that fermented, recycling, culturing the bacteria and sending it in, seeding it, got the aeration basin. All he does now is cycle the air on and off, and there's some dead zones in that aeration basin, and look at the phosphorus. Biologically, no chemicals are added. A treatment plant where a guy is going for one to six hours, eight hours a day, probably is a rare day uh, at the facility. Knowledgeable doing some process control, but his total phosphorus for years is average 0.3 or less. Well, that's quite a success story. Helen is a bigger plant, very complicated. We're going to blow past that. And a lot of people that thank uh, for uh, giving me stories to tell you and support me in giving those stories. So let's do a final polling question. And uh, one more reminder, there will be no webinar next week. It's going to be the week after. So if you want to do the polling question and close it out, um, let's do that. And run up your answers, okay? I mean, I, I think it's okay to say that you, you've learned something from this, and then and maybe I'll get a bonus in my pay if you say that. No, seriously, let's, let's be humble to Tennessee and give honest responses.
right. Breathlessly, we wait for the response. Okay. We just have a couple, wait on a couple more people. Close that out here in just a couple minutes, a minute. All right, close this. <laughs> My appeal works. Some people moved up. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. All right. I think we cooked the numbers a little bit. All right, if you send it back to me, I'll just give a closing slide and then uh, call it a day. All right, once again, no, no uh, webinar next week, but week after, we'll do what should be the best webinar of the series. We may not be saying much. Uh, so thank you. Uh, any last questions, uh, bring them out there. Otherwise, uh, see you in two weeks. Same place, same time, same presenter. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you, Drake.